So what I do is, um, is generate a graph like this, okay, a graph like this where I fix those market factors. I fix all the feed, or all the milk price indicators, and I fix the feed price indicator, and I end up with a in static income over feed cost, static meaning I fix those market factors. The only thing that change the numbers on this dairy are cow performance, and this is fat, protein, tank average, and dry matter intake. They're the four measurables on this dairy, four very simple numbers, but this says everything about management on this dairy. Every change we made to this dairy, reproductive changes, heat abatement changes, they all show up here. If they don't show up here, they didn't work. It's just that simple. If they don't show up here, they didn't work. So this graph is, to me, a primary one to track on a dairy, looking at the static income over fee cost. And on your dairies, uh, if we're going to do this for a grazing herd, um, I think it's a little more complicated to get your, uh, your income over feed cost, but this is the way I think is the best way to do it, the way that large grazing herd I work with, the way we do it. The milk income is pretty straightforward, right? You know how much milk a cow gave, um, and we'll use a static milk price. So the milk income is pretty straightforward. Feed costs, I think you need to use a cost per kilogram estimate on, on the total dry matter. So what your total ration, including your grass, costs per kilogram of dry matter. And then I'd probably use a market type indicator, something that a, a TMR type herd might have. Like right now, you might use like 30 cents per kilogram of dry matter. And then estimate the dry matter intake that your cows should be eating biologically how much they should be eating biologically. So there's equations out there. We use an equation from uh, the NRC, which is a research publication, okay? And those equations simply uh, predict dry matter intake for individual cows based on body weight, milk, fat, protein, and days in milk. And it's important that we do this for each individual cow, not for the overall dairy. Because if you think about it, if you had two different dairies, all right, and each dairy had two cows. Dairy A had a cow at, at one day in milk and a cow at 300 days in milk. What would be the average days in milk? All right. Dairy B had two cows that were each 150 days in milk. The average would also be 150, but the distribution is quite different and the feed cost, the dry matter intake, and the milk would be completely different. So we can't use averages for a herd and calculate an average dry matter intake. We've got to do it for each individual cow. So what I do is dump the data out to a spreadsheet from my uh, uh, dairy management software program and dump out those five parameters there. Body weight, I'm going to estimate. I'm not going to measure that on every cow. I'm going to look at the breed they've got, take a pretty good guess on, on what, what they probably weigh for first lactation and older cows. Then, uh, then I know what their milk and fat is and protein because we've done a milk test every month and I know what her days in milk is and I can get pretty close on predicting dry matter intake within a few hundred grams across the whole herd on most herds. So I can use that plus my feed cost per kilo of dry matter and I can come up with a really good income over feed cost that I think it allows you to answer that question. Or my, is my dairy performing better? Am I getting more out of my grass than I did a year before? So again, this income over feed cost metric, a lot of people think like, oh, this is just for free stall herds, it's just for confinement dairies. I really think the application of this principle is uni universal across dairy businesses. We just have different uh, ideas of where it should be and different ways to measure it, but I think conceptually it's still the same, and I think it's going to be the best indicator for you if you've got more out of your grass. And again, I total this, I would calculate this on a per cow basis, but I'd multiply it by the number of cows that are out there and get total dollars of income over feed costs. My dairy generated this month compared to same month last year, compared to same month the year before. Now I got a great number to say, man, are we doing better? Is my dairy performing better? Uh, okay, last thing on our feed cost issue and this margin and ratio thing. After we finish this, then we'll hit into uh, money corrected milk. I'll try to convince you that kilograms of milk solids isn't the best way for you to look at your herd, and then we'll go on to replacement costs, and that'll probably most likely finish it up. So uh, this one here is a table just looking at different ways to look at feed costs and looking at the change in our markets over the last 10 years that we, we used to, again, in the old days, we'd had cheap milk and cheap feed, and they scaled up over time. They both moved together. And they're both sometimes moving independently, don't, don't necessarily move in the same direction, which makes the margin concept absolutely critical. So let's look at several ratios 
okay, of Cal Performance, and then we'll go to several margins and see the difference. So our first uh, ratio is feed cost per liter. We kind of hit that before. So in the as as we get higher feed milk prices, our feed cost per liter just climbs, climbs, climbs. So you look at that and say, gosh, we'd much rather be here. Our feed cost per cow does the same thing. Kind of what we showed before, not anything new. This milk to feed ratio is one that my country loves to produce. In fact, our government calculates this every month. And our government does stupid things at lots of times. Does your government ever do stupid things? It may not. Our government does. So they, they produce this. And if you ever read any U.S. dairy magazines, you'll see the USDA milk feed price ratio published monthly. It's completely asinine. But yet they do it every month, and they consider it an economic barometer of how healthy our dairy industry is. And it's a completely backwards. So you can see here this milk feed ratio. It says on the website, the government website, that if the milk feed ratio is above 3.0 to 1, it is a good time to convert feed into milk. And the further it goes lower than that, the worse it is. So what's your conclusion here? Man, that thing is absolutely going to hell. And it's, we've been 1.3, 1.4 for a long time, and it has absolutely nothing to do with dairy profitability. So I don't know if you have people within your industry or any place that look at price feed ratios. Again, anytime you have a numerator and a denominator, stop and say, this is going the wrong direction. I'm going to make a mistake. Let's not do it. If you are subtracting and have a margin, you'll be right. So our first margin is income over feed cost. You can do that per liter, just an income over feed cost margin per liter. So there you can see our margin per liter is going up. And this is something I also calculate on P&Ls is this margin per liter. You can see, man, we, we've, we're gaining another five cents per liter. That five cents per liter is going to cover all the other expenses on the dairy. And then we have an income over feed cost just in dollars per day. And again, you can see that one climbing as well. So we've got to use those margins. There's a variety of ways we can look at margins. Um, when we get to replacement costs, we're going to look at a trade-in margin, not a ratio. So percentages and ratios are problematic. So I told you when I started, I'd, I'd convince you that margins are better than ratios. So hopefully I've done that. So end of that. So let's look at components. Uh, most of you, I assume, get paid for fat and protein. There are some notable exceptions here, but this is a graph of fat percent in three regions of the U.S. over a two-year time period. So we've got up here, this is our wintertime, summertime, wintertime, summertime, wintertime. Does that kind of thing happen in Australia? A seasonal change in fat? Pretty much happens everywhere I go, right? Yours is just opposite of ours. Well, the three lines there represent California, the Pacific Northwest, which is Washington and Oregon, and the green is the Southwest Rocky Mountain states. If you're not familiar with those areas, the blue line of California is extremely hot in the summertime. The red line is very cool in the summertime, and the green line is somewhere in between. If you look at that, do you think that heat stress has anything to do with the drop in fat percent? You look at that and say, no, it's all seasonal. This graph really shows that most of the change in components is seasonal. Now, I still think there is some component of it, of, of doing a better job of cooling your cows in the summer to reduce some of that drop, but the majority of the change in fat is uh, seasonal. So if you were, uh, let's say, to have a constant milk price to where at the first of the year, your, your milk buyer came to you and said, we're going to pay you $8 a kilo for protein and $5 a kilo for fat, and it was going to be that way all year. It was never going to change. How different would the value of your milk be in the wintertime versus the summertime? It'd be tremendously different in value. So when we don't adjust for the components in the milk or the value of the milk, we overestimate our financial performance in the, in the hot times, and we underestimate our financial performance in the good times. So we end up looking at our biz business seasonally very different than what it actually is. So we need to have a way to account for that value of the milk. So what? Protein kind of does the same kind of thing. You know, it's not quite as clean, but you can see that same seasonal variation. So uh, the question is, how can we quantify this economically, this concept of differing components? And I struggled with this for years to come up with a good way to do it. And I'm not very smart. That's why it took years. So here's the typical way that we, we do this in the U.S. We use this fat-corrected milk and energy-corrected. And I know you guys don't use that much. Uh, we use this stupid feed efficiency milk feed ratio thing pounds of milk per pounds of feed or kilos of milk per kilos of feed, which is completely stupid. But you guys use this milk solids. 
which makes more sense than any of those others, but still isn't quite perfect. So I'm going to go through uh, using a milk pricing example from Australia. Your milk may not be priced exactly the same way, but I'll go through it and kind of lead you through the methodology. 